and welcome to the last, uh, fourth in this series of seminars for Spring Harvest 2020 on the theme of the Lordship of the Spirit over the Church. My name is Matthew Nell. I teach the history of Christian thought uh, and the history of the church at the London School of Theology, uh, LST. Uh, and uh, we've been looking at different phases of the church's experience through history as it seeks to live under that Lordship of the Spirit, the Lordship uh, demonstrated in the Book of Acts and then carried on through the history of the church. We've been looking at their strengths uh, and at some of their weaknesses to learn about uh, how we can uh, allow the Spirit greater lordship and what we need to be wary of as we live out the Christian faith uh, in the world today. We've done three studies so far. We've done a study of the early church, looking through the first couple of hundred years uh, at the church as it comes out of the Book of Acts, as it, as it extends uh, some of the practices uh, and beliefs there uh, through its experiences. Uh, then the second section, we looked at the medieval church uh, and its great uh, belief in the doctrine of the church as the place where the spirit is active, something that we can learn from uh, in our churches today. And then the third section, we looked at the Protestant churches and the Lordship of the Spirit, uh, most clearly seen in the approach to scripture, uh, the word uh, to, to the Bible. Um, and uh, learnt about the, the necessity of holding to a high view of the authority of Scripture in the Christian faith uh, and what that can look like uh, and what uh, some of the dangers are uh, if we limit the Spirit uh, to a voice only through Scripture. In the fourth and final of these uh, sessions uh, in this series, we're looking at the charismatic churches, uh, Pentecostal and charismatic churches over the last uh, century, century and a bit. And uh, I, I need to give some credit for this seminar to uh, a task I was asked to do by COCM, the Chinese Overseas Christian Mission, who invited me up last autumn uh, to talk about uh, the charismata. What are the charismata and what is their role or what should their role be uh, in the church today? And uh, I found as I was preparing for that teaching uh, and uh, asking those basic questions that I was quite challenged. I've taught about the charismata in a whole range of different contexts uh, in uh, LST and at various other places. But uh, starting right at the basics and trying to work my way up, I, I was challenged, as I say, by some of the things that I found. And so a lot of that I'm going to share with you today. Again, we're going to set a, a background in an understanding of what we're talking about, uh, including the period that we're talking about. Then we're going to look at some of the great strengths that we need to honour and to seek to uh, embed in our churches today. And we'll look at some of the dangers that are associated uh, with this movement as we've looked at dangers associated with the previous phases of the church so that we can think about what our churches could look like, perhaps even should look like. Um, and that's a, a great uh, opportunity for us in these times, dark times, even if the weather is particularly good at the moment, uh, everyone wanting to get out. But these times when we are rethinking church and doing church in new ways as we do it online and through Zoom and through various other things, uh, it seems that this series seems to have been quite providential uh, in its preparation as I've been doing it over the last few months and suddenly this crisis uh, has appeared. So what are the charismata? The charismata are the gifts of the Holy Spirit uh, and therefore in that they are empowerment by the Spirit, uh, they are right at the core of the Spirit's lordship over the church uh, as an issue. Uh, there are more ordinary gifts of the Spirit, uh, things like administration or teaching uh, from the lists that are found in the Bible. And then, of course, there are much more extraordinary gifts of the Spirit, uh, gifts such as uh, healing and speaking in tongues and prophecies, visions and dreams. Um, that's, that's kind of what we're talking about. Uh, and... Uh, the first section of, of today's seminar is going to take a slightly different approach to our, the previous sessions because we're going to go right back to the Bible and look through the Bible uh, and its use of or its, its witness to the giftings of the Holy Spirit in the church. And I think this is important because too often when we go to this area, we start at uh, 1 Corinthians 12 and 14 and Paul's uh, letters. And we need to recognize that that letter was written in the context of the revelation of God through the Old Testament and in Christ. Uh, and that helps us to frame what Paul says uh, about the Holy Spirit in his letters and indeed what we find uh, in the book of Acts. So we're going to do a, a very brief three-part uh, study of the Bible's witness to the gifts. It has to be brief because this seminar can't go on for too long. So we start in the Old Testament where we need to recognize that there are the gifts of the Holy Spirit at work in God's people. 
uh, in individuals such as Joseph with the ability to interpret dreams, uh, in Moses, uh, of course, as the leader of the people, a spirit uh, given to him and to others to judge the people, in the kings such as uh, uh, David in particular, uh, in the prophets later on, even in people like the craftsman Bezalel, who appears in the Alpha Course. Uh, much to my shock when I first read the Alpha Course, it seemed uh, a little detailed to me, but great to see Bezalel being honoured in that category. So we have the gifts of the Spirit as being a key witness to the work, continued work of God in God's people, uh, even after the fall through the Old Testament. But it is occasional uh, and individual for particular tasks in the Old Testament. And so there, there is a, a difference between the giftings of the Spirit in the Old Testament and that that we find in the New Testament. Then we need to go to Christ. It's very important that we go to Christ uh, with the right approach. Uh, I think a lot of us are taught in our churches to view Christ's teaching and his miracles as a result of him being God. Uh, and that's not the major approach that it's taken by the Bible itself and by Jesus himself. Uh, you see this particularly in Matthew, Mark and Luke's Gospels, uh, where he is very clearly presented as the spirit anointed Messiah through whom the spirit is at work in his teaching and in his miracles. Jesus himself says, it is by the spirit that I cast out demons and therefore you know that God is present among you. So the active agent in Christ's ministry and in his miracles is the Holy Spirit. This is important because Christ is not only the revelation of God to us, the greatest revelation of God to us as a church. He's also the revelation of humanity to us, of redeemed humanity, of spirit-empowered humanity. And so he says to his disciples who are wondering at uh, the great things that he has done, that they, the, the, the disciples and the church will do greater things than these, because it is the same spirit at work in the church that was at work in Christ. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is present. And one of the things you see in the book of Acts uh, is a replication of the church doing things that Christ had done by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the, the great witness of the book of Acts, uh, of the works that we are called to do. And then Paul in his letters in particular uh, extends this uh, and not only provides these lists of gifts of the Holy Spirit and talks about a few of them, uh, particularly in the, in the 1 Corinthians context, but has a wider theology of the Holy Spirit about the lordship of the Spirit over God's people and over the church, um, that we are to walk with the Spirit, that we are to follow the Spirit, that we are to be slaves to the Spirit uh, in the language of the book of Romans. Um, and so our whole identity is to be found in Christ by the Spirit, and our whole lives are to be empowered by the Spirit so that we no longer trust in ourselves and our own strengths, but only in the God who has saved us and the Spirit who empowers us. So that is a very brief summary survey of, of the gifts of the Spirit in Scripture, and that then continues on, that, uh, that attitude very clearly continues on through the early centuries of the Church that are resting on the power of the Spirit uh, rather than on their own gifts, their own understandings. Uh, they are expecting the Spirit to give them wisdom, uh, to guide their thinking, to empower their lives. Uh, I was just reading this morning uh, Augustine's City of God. Someone has to read at some point. Uh, and I came across a chapter of 12 pages of miracles uh, that uh, Augustine sees the Spirit working through the church in his time in the early 5th century. Uh, so this is a, a consistent pattern for the church uh, through its early centuries, through the whole history of the church. There have been miracles and other witnesses to the power of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit at work uh, in the church. However, one thing that does happen uh, as the church goes through the centuries is that it develops competencies and confidences in its own ability to do things. Uh, it develops a confidence in the services that it uh, produces, uh, in its financial stability, in its political uh, position of, of being favoured uh, as opposed to being a persecuted church, in the beliefs that it develops through the, uh, the study of theology, the study of, of God's word. Uh, it develops uh, a confidence in its leadership, uh, and at times that, uh, that seems to be uh, warranted and other times it very clearly uh, is not. So we, we'd have this, this switch uh, in the attitude of the church uh, and it's not only in church matters that this is uh, taking place but in whole life matters. So you see through uh, the medieval and early modern period, uh, through the industrial period, an increasing confidence in humanity, 
in, in their abilities in science, uh, in cosmology, study of the universe, uh, in medicine, in work, in finance and banking, uh, such that uh, we fall into Richard Dawkins' critique of the church at times, that we become a god of the gaps, that if we can't do it ourselves or understand it on our own, we allow God to do it or to understand it. But as soon as we become proficient in that area, we take it away from God and do it ourselves. And it's a very challenging uh, question for, for, for myself, for, for perhaps for you and for our churches to look at my life and the things that I do in my life and the things that we do as a church on a Sunday and in our other areas and consider what, it, what needs the Holy Spirit uh, to function uh, in those areas of our life uh, and what do we simply look for a blessing of the Holy Spirit on what we are doing. Uh, and sadly, too much of what I do and what we do as a church doesn't seem to need the Holy Spirit. Uh, and of course, that must be wrong. Uh, and therefore, we need to, to, to consider this. And the, the Pentecostal charismatic churches are, are a great encouragement to us to seek lordship of the Spirit. They come out of uh, a, a growing dissatisfaction with the church through the 18th and 19th centuries in particular that seems to have lost uh, spirit and spirituality. Uh, and so you have a, a growing movement of prayer across the world for the spirit to break out as uh, it had done at Pentecost uh, to take lordship of the church and to ignore, inaugurate uh, the, the return of Christ and the coming uh, of the eternal kingdom. So uh, we've got these, these, uh, these Pentecostal charismatic churches that uh, are arising uh, around the world in the early 20th century and, of course, developing through to charismatic de uh, denominations or charismatic movements within more traditional denominations uh, over the last 50, 60, 70 years. Uh, and we'll start, as uh, we normally do, uh, with the, the great strengths within this in terms of the Lordship of the Spirit. And there's, there's four or five that we can very clearly see. The first I would focus on is, is uh, harkens back to our first session on the early church, and it's the movement towards holiness. Pentecostalism, particularly in its American early uh, phases, comes out of a movement called the holiness movement, which is part of a Wesleyan spirituality developing through the 19th century. Uh, and early Pentecostalism in America and in many other areas of the world places a great value on the, the, the need for Christians to live holy lives, empowered by the Spirit uh, as part of their submission to the Lordship of the Spirit. I mentioned in a previous session that this is something that we've lost in our churches today. There's not a lot of teaching about the need to really pursue holiness. One of the, the sections of the church that does still retain this uh, as a heavy part of its teaching is the Pentecostal, are the Pentecostal churches uh, uh, and some charismatic churches, generally slightly more distinctive of, of Pentecostalism a demand that uh, the members of churches submit to the Spirit in this area uh, of their lives uh, and seek holiness uh, as their core identity. Uh, that is, a, that is a, a wonderful lesson to us um, uh, and should begin to challenge uh, the kind of spirituality we looked at in the last section, uh, session, which uh, Bonhoeffer sees uh, as being us uh, offering ourselves a kind of a cheap grace uh, in, in our lives. Second area that I would highlight uh, is the life of the church. The church uh, is alive in the spirit. One of the, the problems that uh, a lot of people had with the church through the 19th century was that it seemed to be pretty dead. Uh, concepts of life seemed to be projected to the, into the life to come rather than spec, uh, expected as part of our current experience. So the idea of living life to the full didn't seem to be something that the church was encouraging its members towards at this time. And uh, it's a, in some ways remarkable that this push towards living life in the spirit comes actually often from parts of society where this would seem to be hardest. And so Pentecostalism often uh, uh, grew most quickly amongst the poor, amongst the dis dispossessed, the disenfranchised, uh, even amongst those who were living through an equivalent of slavery in their lives. They were taught that they were alive in the spirit and therefore they had joy. Uh, joy in all times, even in line with James's letter, joy in their sufferings. Uh, and that's a great, uh, uh, a great witness to uh, churches uh, made up perhaps of those who are more wealthy in worldly terms, who don't seem to be living with great joy. Uh, so life in the spirit is a, a key distinctive uh, 
of, of charismatic spirituality uh, and certainly something that we need to uh, make a, a core part of the spirituality of the church as a whole. The third is perhaps the most obvious uh, of the charismatic Pentecostal strengths in terms of lordship of the spirit and that is the power of the spirit. Uh, there was uh, a movement particularly in uh, European and North American Christianity, and this would be true not only uh, of Protestantism, but also of other uh, denominations, where there began to be a, a lack of expectancy of God to be active in the church. Um, the most famous, perhaps almost notorious, um, uh, example of this is the cessationist movement, which denies the continuation of certain spiritual gifts after the New Testament church. But uh, even beyond that, in other churches that would at least in their heads uh, allow that God is still active in the world and able uh, to do miraculous things, uh, you see an increasing sense of uh, spirituality, worship uh, and prayer of what I call footnoted spirituality. So there is a, a banner headline that says, we believe God can do all things. But then there's a very long footnote which says, but he probably won't because it's not his will and various other things are going on. And therefore, there's a big get out clause. Um, and there, there's a sense that there's not a great expectancy of God to be powerfully at work in creation in a lot of churches. Uh, and the, the Pentecostals came along and said, no, the spirit is, at, is active. Christ has ascended. The spirit is, is present in the church. And the spirit is the, is the spirit uh, that raised Christ from the dead and can do remarkable things. And if we live in faith, then we should expect this power to be at work in us and through us for the building of the kingdom, for the building of the church. And that's a, that's a great strength. One other thing that I'll mention at this point, which I'm going to then twist around somewhat, is the early Pentecostal change of posture. Posture is something I've talked about in a couple of the other sec uh, sessions. Uh, the posture of how you come into church. The early church came into church seeking to participate uh, seeking in the 1 Corinthians 12 language to bring a word of knowledge uh, or a prophecy uh, or a teaching to contribute, to be active in their faith. The, the medieval and early modern, industrial, uh, even 20th century church, both Catholic, Orthodox and Protestant, tended to be a church that was uh, objects of the faith. So we came in our, in our lines and had church done to us rather than by us, with some encouragement perhaps when we left to start doing a bit of church but not any kind of activities that we were being particularly prepared for uh, in, in the church services themselves. Early Pentecostalism challenges this. Uh, you see it very clearly in Los Angeles, in the Azusa Street revival, in the church led by William Joseph Seymour, where you have uh, no pulpit, uh, no, no preached sermon, but rather a gathering of believers together, seeking God to speak through any individual who's present, black or white, male or female, uh, in order to be present and to be powerfully active in that church. So there was a posture of participation that was a key to uh, early Pentecostalism at least, and is still present in smaller churches, house churches and smaller Pentecostal and charismatic churches today. This is one of the, the, the areas though that I'm going to start to, to pick up on some of the dangers, which is that once these churches reach a certain size, and it seems to be in the sort of 30, 40, 50 uh, category, you start to have a, a shift in this, this element where you, you, you shift the dynamics of the church from being community looking at each other to starting to have leaders at the front uh, and lines that, that are developed, where even if I am singing along with everyone else, I, I can barely hear myself singing because of the volume of the, of the music that is being played. Uh, and so that's a, that's a warning, I think, where we end up with a charismatic Christianity where, again, we come uh, to have church done to us rather than done by us. Uh, and if charismatic Christianity is going to, to mirror biblical charismatic Christianity, it needs to be participatory within the church service, not only when I, when I leave that I expect to, to, to be doing part of the mission of God in the world. So, so that's, that's one warning that I think we need to, to be careful of. Secondly, uh, I think there are, there are warnings uh, about how we treat uh, the gifts of the Spirit. Some early Pentecostalism fell into a couple of traps with this. Uh, one was in their approach to speaking in tongues and mission, uh, where you had uh, a stream, not, not uh, all streams, but some streams, uh, where you would have people going into new uh, countries or even new continents uh, 
uh, where they didn't know the language, where they would expect to be given knowledge of that language uh, as the understanding of speaking in tongues in line with a kind of Acts 2 idea that everyone heard the, the disciples speaking in their own language. And there are accounts of people who did receive such a gift and were able to communicate the wonders of God in, in the language of uh, the people that they were speaking to. Uh, but often this was not the case uh, and that caused uh, so, some problems for the missionaries. The other is in the area of healing, where you had a number of missionaries going into contexts without due medical support or preparation, assuming that if they got ill, that they would be able to pray for healing and receive healing. And again, some did receive that, this, this kind of healing, but many died uh, as a result of that. Uh, and that's a, a slight problem with our understanding of giftings uh, of the Spirit, that we need to make sure that when we're talking about the spiritual gifts that we are given, we, we ensure that the, the Spirit retains lordship over those gifts. Spiritual gifts that I, I have are not gifts for me to be given so that I can use them. They are gifts that I am given so that the Spirit can use them in me. Uh, so it, it, I don't become lord over my gifts where I can choose when I'm going to fire off my spiritual gifts that I have. But rather I need to retain a humility before the Spirit uh, in every situation. Uh, to say these are spiritual gifts that, are, that have been um, demonstrated through me. Uh, where where does, does God want me to be present so that I can be an instrument for his spirit to be at work and, and retain that lordship? So my spiritual gifts are not my spiritual gifts. Uh, they are God's spiritual gifts in me to be used through me uh, in accordance with his, his will rather than my will. And some of our language tends to create a lordship of the spirit in Christians rather than in the God who has sent those spirits. There are other uh, issues. Going back to the, the posture issue uh, and to, to indeed to the wider issue of the charismata in the church today, charismata are the spiritual gifts and, and that seems to be fairly well uh, understood. Charismatic Christianity set, tends to have wandered away from uh, the concentration on the spiritual gifts. So nowadays when we talk about charismatic Christianity, we're generally talking about an atmosphere, often about a style of worship, rather than necessarily about spiritual gifts in themselves. Sometimes those atmospheres of worship encourage particular spiritual gifts, most notably speaking in tongues. Uh, but it, it does seem to be the experience of heightened spirituality that we're talking about, rather than necessary, necessarily particular spiritual gifts. Now that becomes a, a problem once you get developed churches and movements within charismatic Christianity. Because what we have with uh, large congregations, are, which are often have a, a good degree of wealth associated with them, and very talented people musically, uh, in terms of worship leading, in terms of uh, preaching uh, and teaching, uh, we have a, a danger that we end up creating circumstances, situations, uh, churches, conferences, where you can guarantee a spiritual experience because of the quality of the people who are putting on the event. Uh, and so because of the technology that is present and the skill of the musicians uh, and the considerations of the worship leader uh, and the rallying cry of the leaders and, and preachers, uh, you can come with several hundred people or several thousand people and pretty well guarantee a spiritual experience. Uh, and the question is, where is the place for discernment of the spirits? This is something that is very key in New Testament church that uh, most clearly present in Paul's command to test the spirits, but is not often a major factor within charismatic Christianity. Uh, there seems to be an assumption that if I have a spiritual experience in church, it must be an experience of the Holy Spirit. Whereas I know myself that in certain contexts, I'm bound to have spiritual experiences. When I go and watch two of my students get married, I will have a spiritual experience. The question is not whether I'm having a spiritual experience, but what is causing that? Uh, and part of it is certainly going to be my own love for the students and my own joy in that circumstance. And therefore, often in those kind of circumstances, it can be harder to discern the, the, the work of the spirit, simply because my spirit is so naturally excited in those kind of situations. And often we create such a, a, a situation of heightened spirituality that, again, it can be hard to discern the Holy Spirit's work from a more general spiritual environment that we create. Uh, another point 
that has often been leveled at charismatic Christianity is the place of the word, uh, the Bible in charismatic Christianity. Now, I think this is generally unfair, particularly when I look at early Pentecostalism, uh, where, okay, maybe they didn't have the most developed systematic uh, philosophical theology, but they were rooted in the word. They knew the word, uh, and the word was very much the inspiration for the faith and the life that they were living. I, I think such criticism of that, those churches uh, is very harsh. I think in later Western Pentecostalism, uh, I think there are dangers uh, where we end up in a position of great subjecthood uh, regarding the Bible. So a lot of the language in these churches is, what is the Bible saying to me today? Uh, as if it's going to talk to me apart from how it has talked in the past to the church uh, and how it's understood within the community of, of God's believers. Um, this, is, this is Luther. Uh, uh, shouting to us to always keep the word, the spirit and the church together uh, in our understandings, uh, that we don't suddenly have new revelations uh, of God that strain or even contradict uh, that which is revealed in scripture. Uh, and so sometimes we can get quite arrogant because we have uh, uh, heightened experiences uh, that we can take an authority over scripture. And we need to have that humility that the Protestant churches uh, taught us uh, in the last session that we looked at. The, the final thing that I would say uh, on charismatic Christianity is, is that we have got a little bit glued to the lists of the New Testament. We, I mentioned them earlier, there are three major lists uh, in Corinthians and in Ephesians uh, and in the book of Romans. And the, the list in Corinthians seems to be the dominant one which we use when talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But St Paul is quite clear that those lists are not exhaustive. Uh, they are types of the gifts that we expect uh, to, to experience. And some of those uh, in the list are very clearly present within the congregation, within the church, uh, gifts such as teaching uh, and other gifts. Other gifts seem to be much more general, such as the gift of administration. That's the gift I'm really praying for, and I think my wife's praying for it as well, because uh, that's not my great strength at the moment in life. But what we therefore see is that I think these lists are samples of a much wider spirituality that the Bible is encouraging us towards. In line with that wider teaching of Paul on the Spirit, that our whole lives are to be led under the Lordship of the Spirit, conformed to the Spirit, uh, enslaved to the Spirit, uh, to use Paul's own language. And therefore, it's not a case of finding lists of the Spirit and working uh, of gifts of the Spirit and working out which ones uh, I should be praying for, which ones I've got, which ones I should be using. But rather looking at the person that I'm called to be and the ministries that I'm called to lead and expecting the Spirit to be Lord over each of those identities, each of those ministries. One of the things that I, I teach uh, particularly uh, younger students uh, about is the, the gift of celibacy, which is mentioned in scripture uh, and was heavily mentioned by uh, generations within the early church. Uh, and I ask how many of them have the gift of celibacy. Uh, and it seems that very few young Christians today have the gift of celibacy. One thing I say to them is that whilst they remain single, they should hope to have the gift of celibacy. They don't need to have it for the, their entire lives. Uh, but whilst they are single, having the gift of celibacy is a great advantage. Uh, because if you don't have it in the world today, it can be a real area of struggle for young Christians and many older Christians uh, that we have seen who have fallen in this kind of area. Therefore, when I look at myself, uh, I have a role as a husband. I should expect the, the, the Spirit to empower me to be a husband rather than to doing a, a kind of worldly husbanding uh, gift um, or, or, or ability. I'm a father. I should look to, for the Spirit to be Lord of me in my fathering. I should expect a spiritual gift uh, of fathering if I am going to father as well as I possibly can. I should certainly expect a spiritual gift uh, of teaching given my role uh, as a teacher at college. And that actually brings up a, a subsection of this point, which is that often with gifts that we already have, natural giftings that we have, those can be harder to submit to the Lordship of the Spirit because we are competent in ourselves. And therefore, we need to work that much harder at being humble before the Spirit in something uh, such as uh, teaching, if you have already have a gift of teaching, uh, or, or, or cooking, uh, if you have a gift of cooking. So what I should expect is, is not to look at the lists and try and work out which spiritual gifts I need to do various things, but rather look at who I am called to be and what I am called to do. And in each of those areas expect 
the spirit to take lordship if I submit to the spirit. Because that's really what charismatic Christianity for me uh, is an encouragement towards, uh, is that humility to not look at competences in myself, but to, to rethink my life as a life in the spirit, a life expecting Christ's return, and in the meantime, submitting myself to the lordship of the spirit. And so we have these great encouragements from the charismatic churches, encouragements to be holy because the Holy Spirit is at work in us. And therefore, we, we, we should demand of ourselves a submission to the spirit in that term, in those terms. Uh, a desire for life in the spirit, uh, even when, when life is not going well. And in these chaotic times, uh, that certainly should be uh, the case for many of us, uh, that we feel a little bit out of control uh, as part of this coronavirus crisis. Uh, and yet we are alive in the spirit and we can learn from those uh, members of the Pentecostal charismatic churches who've had little and yet have had joy in the spirit that has brought them life and live in the power of the spirit, uh, knowing that God is living and active in the world today uh, and has been throughout the history of the church uh, and seeking to see him move to empower us, uh, to see healings, to see miracles, to see teachings that can direct the church through dark times, and to celebrate through the times of light. I hope you've enjoyed this series, looking at the Lordship of the Spirit in different phases of the church. I hope you've been challenged uh, about how you, you view the Spirit and how you view the church. I hope you've been encouraged at, at times to pursue the Lordship of the Spirit in new ways, both as individuals and as communities. And I pray that you'll be blessed by all that you receive from Spring Harvest 2020. Goodbye.